Thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for coming uh, and coming for a talk which will not mention the word AI once. Okay. I've done it once, but that's it. Uh, because I think in the big scheme of things, AI is helpful, but will not solve the transport problem. And it's one of the technologies, the many technologies which are currently hyped, which will not solve the transport problem. And uh, I'll try to elaborate on that. Um, I start by asking, is cycling one way forward? And I don't know, but we are going to test it and check it, whether this is a way forward to achieve the objectives which we have set ourselves. Now, let's see how this works. Okay, this setup is not properly set up. To scroll down. Okay, um, first I have to acknowledge that I'm pulling on a lot of uh, reference and research of my students over the years, and I'll mention them as we go along. Now, just to remind ourselves, what is the crisis which we are hit, which is we are running into, and we are running into with all our eyes fully open, and the one is the climate crisis. We've had a taste of it this year, and we had a taste of it in the last year, and it will be coming at us very quickly. And as far as you can make out, the urgency, which I feel in the transport domain and the transport research domain is zero. We are just continuing with our research. We are doing our little bits here and there, uh, but I don't really see us responding to the scale of the threat. And I have to admit that I was just one of them and I just continued to tinker and do this, that, and the other. But I do believe that we have to start changing gear. Now, having that said that, and I think you all know, changing gear will mean that we will have to change our behavior quite radically and quite substantially. <coughs> and when anybody says that, people will tell you, oh, we are just too lazy to change. We are unable to change. The demands of the 805 train are just too much. And the timetabling of the kindergarten is just unchangeable. You can't change it. And I think we have to remind ourselves that we do change. Uh, one study we did, uh, we looked at the willingness to adopt other modes using an RP data set we had collected in Zurich. And uh, as part of that, uh, uh, Daniel Rey estimated choice models to find out what would happen if various modes were made unavailable. And if you look, for example, at removing the car alternative to the travelers, you can see they would change as they have to change. And in this particular instance, they would mostly change to bikes and e-scooters that were the alternative modes which were offered and studied in detail in the study. So people can change if you force them to. Now, this is politically obviously very unattractive, but maybe the climate crisis will force us to. So don't let yourself be deterred by saying, oh, we can't change. Now, having said that, we can draw on the example of COVID. COVID was, to some extent, a big real-life experiment in forced change. Uh, one thing which we did as part of this, uh, we had a sample of people which had participated in a virtual road pricing experiment in the fall of 2019, and we invited them again uh, to participate in tracking their behavior. And about 1,200 people did, and about 300 people still do today. And as part of that, one of the main changes is the share of people who leave the house on any one day. So the blue line gives you the share of people who left the home in 2019 in the spring of 2020, and yellow and red are 
the changes in that share. Red shows you very nicely the drop off during the lockdown period in Switzerland and how it recovered. And that lower share of people leaving the house at all has persisted. So there has been a substantial change in the presence of people on the street. And obviously there are all the other changes which you would expect, changes in mode choice and some change in destination choice. But it's just a reminder that if you are forced, we change. And in this case, we were forced by the threat of an unknown disease. And you can see that the Swiss started to ignore it after it had become familiar. Now, on top of this, we have the problem that transfer policy has a dilemma. And what is the dilemma? The dilemma is transport is a normal good. So the cheaper it becomes, the more we consume it. And any transport policy which changes the perceived price, the generalized cost of travel, and in particular lowers it, will produce more demand. So any policy we are currently discussing, which is lowering the cost of travel, like electric vehicles, like automated vehicles, will produce more demand and therefore come back to haunt us. Now, the question is then, how strong is that response? And there's obviously a big, big empirical literature, or actually not really that big, on the demand elasticity with regard to the generalized cost of travel or in transformed form to elasticity. You all know Sahavi, which made the big claim that the elasticity is minus one. So whatever generalized cost reduction you have will be eaten up by more travel. Uh, it's probably not just minus one, but it's a big one. Here you have the results of uh, Claude Weiss and his dissertation where we constructed an artificial panel of uh, national travel diary data and combined it with transport models which allowed it to estimate accessibility change in Switzerland since 1970 and a transport price index. And you can see that the elasticities we quote here are substantial. And for example, the total distance traveled is actually larger than one. It's a true elastic demand, uh, but the others are so as well. And this is just one study, uh, a thorough study, and it should be matched by others, uh, but there is relatively little empirical results. But anyway, take back home. Whenever we make travel cheaper, people consume more of it. Now, this blocks us. And why does it block us? Because we want the high accessibility. For the last 250 years, societies around the world have invested in making transport cheaper and have perceived it as a socially good thing. And to get that out of our policymaker minds and out of the voters' minds is going to be hard. And why do we think it's a good idea? Because it made us richer. And it's made us richer in terms of money, and it made us richer in, in terms of our social capital, because this meeting here is a good example that cheap and easy travel allows us to meet and meet people we would have probably never met in any other way. Uh, if Haitao had invited us to travel only on the railways, I probably would have said, no, thank you, because it would have taken me two days to get here, a day and a half. So anyway. Travel made us richer socially and materially. And policymakers know this, and that's why policymakers are happy to spend vast amount of money on it. Now, the problem we have is that we then build the systems for peak demands. And that leaves enormously amounts of unused capacity in off-peak, which invites everybody to travel. The best example are the vast seas of parking, which are designed to make sure that you get your Christmas present, but otherwise it's just wasteful 
cash flow for the rest of the year. Then in this situation, we are currently happily investing into electric vehicles and automated vehicles, which will make travel cheaper. So will induce demand. And then working from home, which is a great invention, would, will also make travel cheaper because it allows us to travel in off-peak periods uh, and at other times. Now, in all of these things, are completely contrary to our needs to reduce the CO2 impact, which transport produces. And in particular, the hope for e-vehicles is tempting, but we forget that electric vehicles will probably only lower over the whole life cycle of their existence by a factor of half. So the CO2 impact of the mile of travel will only be half by electric vehicles. So they will not solve the problem, given that we have to reduce our CO2 impact by about 80% from travel. And then on top, you have all the nice things about scroll. Okay, for the Americans and the Australians, that's not a problem. That's natural uh, design for those countries, but in places like Switzerland, it's an issue. And then you have the sheer amount of EMT growth, uh, which comes with it. So what does a policymaker do in this situation? He wants the good thing, but increasingly he doesn't want the bad things. And in the 70s and 80s and in the 90s, these trade-offs could be ignored, but now they're there and can't be ignored anymore. Now, to make it all worse, uh, in the urban areas, we have a situation that uh, the capacity of our road networks is essentially fixed. Uh, two students of the group, uh, uh, Alice Loda and Marcus, uh, Lucas Ambul, did an extensive analysis of the macroscopic fundamental diagrams in about 40 cities around the world, and were able to show that the, and, and the graph you see here is an MFD of involving both public transport vehicles and car vehicles and the total amount of passenger production they can then carry in a particular network. But what they were able to show is that the existing networks have more or less fixed capacity, which is driven by the number of junctions they have per square kilometer, by the density of the public transport uh, amount by the lane density they have and by the topology of the network and in particular the network has a couple of explicit uh, pinch points the networks are more likely to congest than if they don't and you can do hardly anything to change that if you are here today so London in, in a way is doomed to be as congested as it is and will always will be, short of essentially pricing people away, uh, which happened and didn't happen. Now, we have to, at this point, you can say, okay, let's forget about this. Let's, let's become a scientist for something else, which is a bit more optimistic. Go away, let's ignore this. Now, we can't. And what I did do, I was wondering how did the policymaking, which has guided us to our current position, actually happen? And if you think back over the last hundred years, you will see that there were a couple of guiding visions which kept everybody on this path towards more cars more suburbia, more motorways. And they were underlaid by a couple of images more than anything else. Images, not numbers. And I do think that in this current situation, we also need visions which are able to entice and to convince the public on the way forward. <laughs> 
And unfortunately, I do believe that engineering numbers won't do that. But we have to combine this to be convincing. Let me look or show some of those images which convinced everybody. One which was enormously powerful, in particular in England, was this idea of the garden city. Now, Ebenezer Howard's dream, which was more than architecture, it was also a dream about industrial structure, it was a dream about social structure, was at least reduced form realized in a couple of suburbs of London. Letchworth is one of them, just north. Uh, personally, I have never visited, I've only looked at the, the images and the plans. But this is Letchworth Garden City, the dream of suburbia. The other dream were obviously the motorways in the 1920s. Uh, when engineers thought, we have this marvelous car, you have to realize at the time, the cars were becoming more powerful and uh, more cheaper uh, by, the, by the year. And long distance travel became a real option. And they came up with this idea of dedicated roads just for the car. And I am afraid that most car drivers still have these images in their mind when they think of a motorway. They think of motorways, sunlit, empty, and just for them, and not the reality of it being crowded, stinky, and uh, with trucks blocking their way. This was, this was German pictures, but you probably find the same. For, for the US and for Italy and France. Another one of those visions was obviously uh, the modernist movement. Here it's Le Corbusier City Radieuse, uh, where he dreamt up a city which was with modern apartments, uh, windows which close, and with flats which are generous, even an airport right in the middle, motorways with 10 lanes, and again, with no traffic on them. And this was what we had all hoped for when uh, the very much reduced form uh, modernist suburbs were built in the 60s and 70s. And the alternative vision, which actually probably was more powerful, is obviously Frank Lloyd Wright's Uzonia, which was his idea of giving every American a one acre lot and a house on it, connected by roads with the occasional shopping mall and whatever in between. And this would be happiness. Although he also assumed that the Americans would go out and, and garden them, but okay, never mind. Um, but it's these visions, these images, which are in the back of people's minds and which drove us to build our current environment. Now, the current environment was then obviously driven by economics, by policy, and we didn't get these generous visions, but we got what we got. But I think we do need equivalents to guide us to a world in which the travel system, the transport system is compatible in its CO2 production to the natural constraints we are facing. Because happily or unhappily, we are not facing policy constraints, we're facing constraints of physics and physics doesn't negotiate. So what are we currently talking about? There is people who think and want to change. I think the th three main things which I see, and I'm, I'm just happy Please stand corrected if you want to add things. There's a future which is currently thought about, which is all about automation as the solution. There is a future which is all about managing the demand better. And then there are some people who are suggesting that we need to reduce the demand for travel. Demand, reduce or restrict the demand for travel. Now, let's talk about those. 
Oh, sorry. That's first the managed and coordinated one. I think if you ask the traffic planners in the room, they will tell you we can solve the problem. We price. We price the movement using a two stage tariff. We charge people for the option to travel and then we charge them for every kilometer they move. We then charge them extra if they are in congestion or if they're, they are expected to be in congestion. So we charge them even before they generate the congestion. Then we charge them properly for parking. And then we price them for CO2 and all the other emissions they produce. And then we would charge them for noise and any other thing, uh, nasty thing they do by moving. Now, this is a grand vision, and we know it would work, but we also know if the voters have a chance to say anything about this, it will be voted down like a lead balloon. So we go nowhere with this. And the couple of examples where it came through, uh, it was relatively specific conditions. In London, it was the price of having a labor as the first mayor for London. And the only policy he could have because his office was so restricted was transport and pricing was one thing he could do. And he implemented it quick and dirty and London is still paying the price of that in terms of the very expensive system they did. In Singapore, it was implemented because the city wanted to be a shining example of modernity and congestion wasn't part of it. So they overpriced their citizens in the beginning and then let the pricing kind of slowly be eroded by inflation, but they still kept on to it. And in Stockholm, it worked because only those people who benefited were allowed to vote and those who were disadvantaged of it were not allowed to vote. And so it's not something which you can probably win many election campaigns with. And in Switzerland, we had an attempt to bring in a very small amount of CO2 pricing. And it was voted down by the majority because it's a national vote was voted down because the opponents frightened people by these very tiny effective price increases they would have faced under the CO2 pricing law. And that has kind of frightened off the Swiss policy establishment against any pricing for probably the next four or five years before they take their guts together again. Now, so pricing would work, but it's politically un unlikely. Then on the public transport side, everybody hopes mobility as a service. We coordinate everything, everything will work smoothly, everything will be perfect. Now there's all these problems, yes, between these different operators, different rules. Uh, there's a problem, do we really want to have kind of an Amazon-like firm extracting a rent uh, from all the subsidies? So there's issues around there. So mobility as a service. Now, why am I not very optimistic about this? Um, one thing we did, we had collected this MOBIS study, which was these eight weeks of travel behavior of 3,500 people. We estimated more choice models for them, and we calculated the generalized cost of travel for their chosen and non-chosen alternative. And then we compared the total costs estimated uh, and calculated the ratio. And the one thing you can see is that if people don't have a season ticket, that's the thick lines, uh, the car is half as expensive as public transport. And we are talking about a very well run, efficient public transport system in Switzerland. So mobility as a service has an enormous hurdle to overcome. It effectively has to half the price of travel in public transport. Okay, yes, we can do certain things, but I think this would be an enormously expensive exercise. And I'm not sure that many countries around the world are willing to engage in that. 
one thing helps if you get people to commit to a season ticket then the cost ratio is about 1.1 so you'd assume that about 40 percent of people 50 percent of people would choose public transport but that still leaves about 50 percent of people traveling by car so mobility as a service I'm all for it. I'm all for the improvements that generates in the ease of travel with public transport. But I don't believe that it will get us where we need to go for CO2 reduction. Now, the other big hope, and I think the morning you spend on it, is automation. Now, my concern about automation is that it will make things cheaper. Uh, Patrick Bursch in his thesis, plus Felix Becker and uh, Henrik Becker, tried to do the best possible cost estimate of automated vehicles. Now, this is status 2016, so the numbers will have changed. Uh, but the key message of this was that an automated taxi will cost about 40 Swiss cents which for all intents and purposes is 40p these days, given how much the pound has lost external value. Um, um, and the 40p is about a third lower than currently. So there's a massive reduction in uh, the price of travel. And if you look at a private automated vehicle, it's 47p, or Swiss Rappen, uh, for passenger mileage. So essentially equivalent. But the real issue is that the variable cost of an automated private vehicle is only about 17 rappen. So the perceived cost of travel, and this is a very robust result, that people only perceive the variable cost of travel, they don't perceive the fixed cost of travel, is only about a third of an automated taxi. And here we assume that the automated taxi is not subsidized. Okay, if subsidies come in for tax or shareholders which are burning money, I think things are different. But in essence, the message is the aut private automated vehicle will be a lot cheaper than the taxi and certainly a lot cheaper than any pooled services. So we have a system which will invite private travel and therefore congestion. And it invites more private travel because it's a lot cheaper than current travel. So not a good way forward. So which other visions? And some people feel this, some people see this. So people are pushing very hard, at least for urban areas, to think about other things. And the push certainly in the German environment and in the European environment is to make car travel less attractive and push cars out. One vision which has been put forward is for Paris with a 15 minute city. The idea that you can do everything you need to do within a 15 minute walk or maybe a 15 minute cycle ride. I think that's a, that's a nice idea, but I'm just wondering how many cities you have where you have the density and equally important, the purchasing power that you can provide all the services necessary within that range. Because people love Paris and you have good reason to love it, but it's a very rich city which has a supply of cultural and commercial opportunities which are ma which match that richness. If you do a 15 minute city in Loughborough, it is still Loughborough. The purchasing power is just dramatically lower. So the quality of the restaurants, the quality of the hotels will be to match. And that might not be as attractive as a 15 minute city in Paris. And I'm wondering if people confusing the idea of the 15 minute city with the wealth of Paris, which doesn't travel with it. <clears throat> so we have limitations there. There's various attempts at net zero cities, uh, but this is currently all in the planning documents because 
when the public will read that these net zero cities will imply a reduction of car travel by probably a factor of three, uh, they might not be happy. So in this context, I or we have come up with the idea to say, okay, the electric bike is potentially a game changer because effectively it is as fast as a car in the urban area, but it needs dramatically less energy, it needs dramatically less mass. And let us think whether a city which puts the e-bike in the center, obviously with matching public transport, could deliver a level of quality of service which is competitive, maybe even matching today's environment. So we have decided to do a planning and design exercise which wants to test whether an e-bike city could deliver something attractive. We don't know yet whether it will, but we want to have the right to test it and not be told from the beginning, oh, don't even bother. So what is the basic idea of the e-bike city? So the first argument Argument is saying, let's take away 50% of the road space from our way too heavy, way too polluting cars. Just across the board. Mm -hmm. Try whether we can maintain the current levels of accessibility and how we have to integrate, obviously, all the shared services into it, but design it in a way that it can cope with a much larger demand variation, which we'll get when you rely on a, on a vehicle where people are exposed to the weather. And when it, I'm saying explicitly shared services, because the bus and the tram is the prime example of a shared service. It's a big vehicle in which many people coordinate their travel. And all these shared taxis are actually a poor form of that because they only move four or five people uh, instead of a hundred. So, but still, there are demand situations, there are OD pair, but uh, only small vehicles will be commercially viable, so we have to integrate them. So these are the three key ideas, and that's what we have started, the project has just started, we'll try to explore. And there's obviously enormous number of academic questions and research questions, which we have to address on the way to achieve that design goal. We have to look at the life cycle cost of e-bike fleets. We have to look at how we design optimal one-way street systems at a large scale. We have to redesign the road space so that the users actually can live with each other. We have to ask the questions, if we have a shared fleet in there, we have to oper operate it optimally. And there, there, there is already work, but we have to continue. We have to redesign public transport so that it can cope with the large demand variation without massive and excessive costs. We have to ask the question, how can public transport be still reliable? How can we make sure that all the emergency services can still operate in a city like that? What do we do about all the delivery services, which is kind of a background change, all the e-commerce e has to be accommodated. How can we do that in a way which doesn't compete too hard? What are the accessibilities which we will obtain? Will we discriminate against certain groups? Will we be inequitable? How can we avoid that? And then finally, obviously we'd like to do a cost-benefit analysis of it all uh, to see where we go. Now, I don't believe that the cost-benefit analysis will clinch the argument, but I think we are engineers, so we should do it uh, just to satisfy ourselves. And with that, I'm looking forward to your questions.